explanation, or you see a point that wasn't even developed at all, please uh, jot that down for Q&A. And as AJ mentioned, uh, that offer extends far beyond this webinar. If you think of something in the next couple of days, uh, send your question in, and the question and answer, if it's general interest, will be sent to all of you in attendance. And if you think of something months later, please, again, uh, uh, contact me through compliance trainings or directly, and I will respond individually to that question or point you in the right direction. Now, when we're talking about ISO 14971, this discussion is geared more heavily to FDA than it is to uh, overseas, CE market, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the FDA uh, is looking for risk management, hazard analysis in a general format, and they accept the ISO 14971 as a de facto standard. Uh, the 2007 version is the, uh, the basic standard. Uh, it has been updated, and many of you are aware of the EN ISO 14971-2012. It's controversial. We'll discuss a little bit about that. That's for the European Union. For the rest of the world, most of them are still at the 2007 version, so that can be a little confusing. But if you're selling product that's class 2A, 2B, or 3 under the European designation of classification, you will have a notified body. And you should work with that notified body because they can tell you which parts of the various forms of ISO 14971 apply to the various countries in which you will be selling product and where you will have to have a copy of your risk management file and report in your technical file slash design dossier. So uh, uh, that's the caveat to this discussion. We'll be talking about the generalized aspects of ISO 14971. If you have specific needs outside the United States, you will have to address those or make sure you talk with your notified body before you submit your technical file or design dossier for a audit. Uh, we'll also briefly discuss ICHQ9, but to me, 14971, although it's geared for devices, has a format that is a little, I find, a little more easier to develop than the more nebulous ISO ICHQ9, which is for pharmaceuticals. But the basic principles are the same. If you develop uh, what we talk about here in a, a quote-unquote model, uh, you will basically satisfy the requirements of ICHQ9 for pharmaceuticals. The only difference is uh, that's geared for pharmaceuticals, 14971 the appendices are geared to devices. But the basic principles uh, can be utilized each way. And with the FDA for devices, they, like I said, they accept the de facto standard of 14971. The discussion I present here is, has been field proven. It, it has withstood audits by the FDA and by various notified bodies, not only for devices, but this model has also been subjected to pharmaceutical audits and also by uh, dietary supplement audits and combination product audits. So it, it is a model. Just as I mentioned, if you're shipping overseas, make sure you tailor your requirements and your terminology to your specific notified body. Each notified body has a slightly different take on things, a slightly different expectation. Makes it a little more confusing, but that's the reality of the situation. And each country they take the ISO 14971, they add an EN to it for European Union, and then they add their own additional to their own country requirements to that. And so you've got almost three levels of 14971, depending on which country you're shipping into in Europe. So that's another point to keep in mind, hence the need for a notified body to be working with, which you'd have to hire anyway to do the audits. <clears throat> we'll be talking about these other areas and discussing some of the terminology. And for those of you that are very actively involved in forums on the web, you will know there's all kinds of arguments all over the map regarding what we'll be talking about here. So just be aware of that fact. This is not theoretical, though. What we're discussing here has worked for many years, and in, in several cases, at least for the FDA, has resolved an adversary-type audit situations with large multinational corporations, and the FDA. I've done over 40 of these that have been reviewed by the FDA and a smaller portion of those 40 uh, reviewed by 
four or five bodies. Uh, the definition of risk, again, if you go to the Internet uh, and also if you look at the standards, you will find risk and hazards defined a little more narrowly. Follow those definitions, but wherever possible, if you have to, to clarify the definition. Uh, I know the FDA takes no, has no problem with this if you define your own working definition that is under the umbrella definition and include that working definition in your SOPs and then, of course, follow your own SOPs. But in the 2007, which is the basic standard, it's been upgraded in 2009, but the basic standard is ISO 14971 2007. It is also in the European Union, been upgraded to 2012 with a major change we'll talk about as we get to that. Uh, this is interesting. The FDA's website has the same point as this bullet mentioned in 14971-2007. The use of a medical device, or we could say the use of any medical procedure, entails some degree of risk to the patient. Whenever we talk about risk, ultimately here, as far as the focus for the FDA and most notified bodies is the risk to the patient and user. Obviously, there's risk to the company, there's liability issues, and that some of that can be factored into this model. That's up to you. But the bottom line for everything we're talking about here in terms of compliance is risk to the patient, the end user. Paragraph 8 brings out the manufacturer makes judgments relating to safety of medical device, including the acceptability of risk. I know uh, actually industry prefers this, but in reality they, they, they like to have the regulatory agencies define things a little more narrowly. It's up to you to define these judgments and develop your rationale for these judgments, document the rationale, and have a good basis for it. Throughout our discussion, there's a couple of slides that mention the fact you should have a clinical review of your documents. And I usually say that should be a doctor, a registered nurse, or other practitioner who's familiar with that device and its use on a patient. Uh, and that person should be reviewing the documentation as part of your team and should be involved in the setting of uh, severity and uh, probability of, uh, of occurrence type things along with other sources of that type of information. And again, this is a very useful tool, but it is still subjective. And if you go on the Internet, you'll find people beating the subject to death in terms of terminology, in terms of what this means versus what that means. Uh, the FDA does not take issue with that as long as you are using this in a proper way to uh, mitigate, reduce, eliminate risk to the end user to the degree possible. Your notified body, that's a different story. Again, you work with them. And all of you may see what's taking place in the narratives out on the Internet. Don't let that throw you or confuse you. Uh, what we present here will pass FDA audits, and if it's done right, will help you mitigate risk on your products. Uh, with the notified body, again, you're dealing with each one separately. So even what you read on the Internet uh, may give you a good idea of areas to clarify with your particular notified body. Okay, uh, the goal of this activity is not just to come up with a document that passes an audit, obviously. It's to identify hazards associated with medical devices. It's to estimate and evaluate the risks associated with those hazards. So you've got a certain hazard, it poses a risk to a patient because of a hazardous situation, and you need to, again, it's an estimate. Uh, the more you have hard data based on, based on defects per million opportunity as opposed to AQLs or similar measurements, the more accurate your estimate is. But bear in mind, these are tools to narrow the risk, to mitigate as much as possible the risk uh, or control these risks, monitor the uh, effectiveness of the controls, uh, provides a format for product risk management file and report, and we'll discuss the possible format. It's not the only one, but it's certainly one that, as I mentioned, has passed numerous audits. Be aware of the fact that uh, uh, many people argue about uh, the usefulness of tools. 
failure mode and effect analysis, uh, failure mode and effect criticality analysis are documents that have come out of the automotive industry. In fact, the FDA a few years ago hired an automotive consultant to train them in failure mode effect and criticality analysis documentation. And of course, he used a 1 to 10 scale. Most companies I've worked with use a 1 to 5 scale. And that may not make sense to some of you until we get into the actual discussion of that. There's arguments on the Internet that these are totally inappropriate tools for medical devices. I do not agree. Uh, I find them very useful depending on how you utilize them. And that should be spelled out in your SOP. You don't want to go way off in left field, but certainly you can take these tools and with the proper utilization and the proper motive behind them and the proper definition, they are useful in pointing out areas of concern and then helping you to analyze how you can address those areas of concern and then document what you've got left, your residual risk, if you will. Again, I recommend you don't get stuck on definitions, otherwise you'll never get started on this at all or refining your existing system. Uh, those of you that have already got a system may have had it audited already, and you know what your auditors accept or do not accept in terms of terminology, in terms of format, in terms of the entire structure of this document and what it leads you to do as a company and documents what you have done as a company. This should be a living document, and we'll talk about that as well. Now, I think all of us appreciate the fact that over the past few years, we've noticed in all regulatory agencies a, a growing terminology, a use of words like life cycle and risk-based analysis. Now, again, we're talking about risk-based. Risk to your senior management means many different things. Risk to QARA basically should mean 